Lost Media has garnered quite a reputation due to the mysterious nature surrounding it. There are also degrees of Lost Media that keep the community constantly interesting, in my eyes. There are innocent discussions of Lost Spongebob episodes, all the way to manifesto tapes that were left behind by people that intended to cause harm. I find these absolute polar opposites within the community to be fascinating, and I can see why people constantly come back to the Lost Media community. So today, I'm going to be looking into a few pieces of disturbing lost media that exist. If you've already taken a peek at the chapters, feel free to let me know if there's anything that I've missed. If I ever make a follow-up video, your comments are really helpful. Before we dive into the lost media, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. I know you generally see me with contacts in my videos, but I actually do wear glasses a good chunk of the time. And thankfully, the wonderful people over at GlassesUSA.com not only have me covered, but they've got you covered as well. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers over 10,000 prescription glasses and sunglasses, ranging from their in-house brands, such as Muse and Amelia E, all the way to designer brands such as Oakley and Gucci, and up to 70% off retail prices. They're inclusive to contact wares as well, so you can easily stock up and save up to 25% on select brands. With a collection of 10,000 pairs of glasses, I was a little unsure where to even start, but luckily there's actually a quiz built into the website that can help you narrow down what you're looking for. There's also a risk-free shopping experience when you're working with GlassesUSA.com. They have free returns and shipping, additionally as a full money-back guarantee when you return within 14 days. I also wanted to make sure that the frames that I was picking out looked good on my face, so I used their virtual try-on tool, which basically allowed me to easily figure out whether the frames would look good on me. These are the Autodo Remigio Blues, and I absolutely love the way that they comfort my nose. These are the Autodo Remy Silvers, and I absolutely love their super slim body. And lastly, I have the Autodo Copperfield Black Slash Gold. I personally love the colors on this one. It just looks like leopard print, and I, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little obsessed with black slash gold colors, so I love this one a lot. Y'all, make sure to click the first link at the top of the description box below if getting a set of contacts, shades, or glasses interests you. Thanks once again for GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video. Steve Irwin's Final Moments Our first case comes from everyone's favorite wildlife expert, and that is Steve Irwin. If you somehow don't know who this man is, I'll happily fill you in. Steve Irwin grew up around a plethora of reptiles and animals. His father is actually the person that sparked this interest due to the dad actually teaching all there is to know about the animals. Steve would rock it into the public eye through his show called The Crocodile Hunter. The show was hugely successful, reaching around 500 million people around the world. From there, he would appear in all sorts of different shows and movies. Steve was also a major environmentalist and conservationist. He believed that conservation was like the biggest part of his job. He even started his own foundation for conservation and was a huge advocate for considerate tourism and not supporting illegal poaching. It's stuff like this that just makes my heart happy. Seeing people go out of their way to do things that make the world a better place. How could you not love this man? Tragically though, Steve Irwin would die doing the thing that he loved the most. Irwin would be pierced in the chest by a stingray while filming in the Great Barrier Reef. The stinger immediately punctured his heart and made him bleed out. This all happened while he was filming a documentary that was titled Ocean's Deadliest. This entire thing would be filmed due to Irwin's strict rule of always keeping the cameras rolling no matter what happens. Irwin would immediately be pulled out of the water and have CPR performed on him. Once the team made it back to land, he was pronounced dead by the paramedics at the scene. It's reported that one of his last words were, I'm dying. The footage from that day was handed over to the authorities and then returned over to the Irwin family. It's been said that the family destroyed the footage and that there are no more copies out there. Over the years, there have been many things that have sprung up claiming that the footage has been found, but all of these have either been fabricated or taken out of context. What are your thoughts about this footage? I've heard people say that, hey, Irwin actually probably would have wanted the footage out there, but it seems like the family disagrees with that sentiment and doesn't want it out there at all. So what do you think? Should it be out there? Should it not be? Let me know in the comments below. Albert Fish's final statement. Our next piece of lost media comes from Albert Fish. If you don't know about this dude, consider yourself lucky. Actually, I guess consider yourself unlucky because I'm about to 
tell you everything that this guy did. I actually did a video on this guy many moons ago, so if you're interested in seeing Baby Caden and his new YouTube channel uh, tried to explain this one, you can definitely check it out somewhere around my face. But anyway, enough of my blabbering, let's talk about Albert Fish. Albert Fish is a very infamous serial killer that took the lives of children from the mid to late 1920s. There's also a list of like suspected victims out there, but I don't really feel comfortable speculating on that. So we're just only going to go with what is known. Fish had a very unhealthy relationship with his sexual desires and wanting to fulfill them. At 20 years old, he would actively begin prostituting himself and essaying many young children predominantly boys. His desires began to grow more grotesque as he started thinking of ways that he could torture people and mutilate them in like a sexual manner. His first bit of exploration into this was on a 19 year old named Thomas. Fish would lure Thomas into a farmhouse where he then proceeded to slice his you know what in half. Thomas wasn't killed though, interestingly enough. He was set free by Fish, and what happened to him afterward remains unknown. Fish then began to explore the idea of cannibalism, which would actually lead to the death of nine-year-old Francis McDonnell. It was noted that during this child's autopsy that his left hamstring lacked any flesh. Jesus Christ. Eventually, Albert would be reading the New York World and would find an advertisement that piqued his interest. It was an advertisement from 18-year-old Edward Budd. I couldn't find any information on what specifically he was selling, but I'm assuming it's like his services. So if someone needs help with X thing, he'll be able to just provide that. I'm assuming like, just like an extra hand, if you know what I mean. Albert went to the address with the intention of taking the life of Edward. He even went out of his way to give himself a fake name, calling himself Frank Howard. Fish had the intention to hire Edward, but something fell through and he ended up not going through with it. Upon his return to the address though, he met Edward's younger sister, Grace Budd. Albert in that moment would switch his desires from Edward to Grace and even tried to make up a lie on the spot saying that he was actually about to go to a niece's birthday party and that Grace should come along. If you couldn't really tell from this, his intention was to lead the child away from the parents and unfortunately and tragically, it worked. Once led away, Fish would go on to take her life and eat her. There was even a letter written to the parents that delves into even further detail on what happened that day I won't be reading it here because YouTube is really hardcore about stuff with Albert Fish, but if you are interested in reading it, it is on Wikipedia, just fair warning, it's, it's really disturbing. Albert was eventually caught, put to trial, and then sentenced to death via electric chair. Now, with all of this context, with all of this established, we can finally get to the piece of lost media. And that is Albert Fish's final statement. Shortly after the death of Albert, his lawyer revealed that he actually had his final statements in hand. The statement contained apparently pages worth of Albert's writings just hours before his death. The press was obviously itching to know what was within the pages, but the lawyer refused. He stated that, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. And the part that drives me insane the most is the fact that none of the contents have ever been released, not even a hint as to what is within them. So that means only two people know what's within the pages, and that's Albert Fish, who's dead, and his lawyer, who's dead. So I imagine this stuff is never going to see the light of day, but in all honesty, uh, maybe that's a good thing. The Basement Tapes. This next one comes from a pair of the most infamous teenagers ever, and those are the Columbine shooters of 1999. Columbine is what got me into the fascination of true crime, so I know an unhealthy amount of knowledge about this case, and with that knowledge comes tangents and side points. So I'm gonna try really hard to just stay on course and stay on track, but I might go on a few tangents, maybe. Probably. On April 20th of 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold would go through with a shooting that they had planned for a little more than a year. They made all sorts of homemade explosives, 
collected a variety of weapons, and left behind all sorts of media that people even to this day still look into. Eric and Dylan made all sorts of home videos and extensively detailed their plans within their respective journals. It's a little hard to know how genuine Eric and Dylan were when they were writing within their journals. This is due to the fact that they were obviously wanting to be famous. They wanted this to be sensationalized. So I imagine that they were probably going a little crazy writing in there like, yeah, we're going to add all of this stuff. So it's kind of hard to tell what they were really feeling in those journals, what's genuine, what isn't. Tragically, though, they would get what they wanted, the sensation, the Columbine effect is what it's called, which is basically the idea of any school shootings that kind of happen now have some sort of connection back to Columbine. Eric and Dylan often expressed violent themes in their home videos and even on certain projects that were related to school. For example, in an economics class, Eric and Dylan made a video called Hitman for Hire. Just to let you know, the assignment was to create an ad for a business. And Eric chose a Hitman company. Seems a little too on the nose, if you ask me. The video details the shooters walking through the halls in trench coats, shooting bullies outside the school with fake weapons, and basically protecting the weak person that can't defend themselves. I imagine this was actually an echo of their treatment in the school since it's been cited that the pair were heavily bullied. On the day of the shooting, Eric and Dylan would take the lives of 13 people and injure 24 others. Interestingly enough, Columbine wasn't meant to be a school shooting in a way. It was more so supposed to be a school bombing. They went through a lot of planning to make these propane bombs that, thank God, didn't go off when they initially planted them in the cafeteria. The pair would take their lives in the library, leaving behind a collection of home videos that are often regarded as a tutorial on how to commit a school shooting. The tapes have transcripts, and there's actually been projects to make people sort of like recreate what the tapes would look like. After reading through the transcripts myself, there's a lot of fascinating things that happen within them. When Eric and Dylan are together, you can almost visualize is how they feed off of each other's energy. One hyping up the other, almost being joyful and ecstatic about what they're going to go through. But in the next tape, it shows Eric in his car appearing to cry, saying that he wishes he could have met with more old friends before he was going to go through with what he was going to do. The tape's notoriety has called for many fakes to be released. The only legitimate thing to have been leaked from the basement tapes actually comes from Rachel Scott's father, Rachel being a victim of the shooting. I won't be showing the audio since YouTube is always super excited to remove anything in regards to Columbine, but it is out there. The tapes only gained more of a reputation when it was found out that the police department that was holding the tapes had reportedly destroyed them. I imagine there's some sort of copies out there. There's no way that they just destroyed the tapes. Or maybe they did, and I'm the dumbass. Anyway, the basement tapes are often regarded as one of the most sought after pieces of lost media. The likelihood of this stuff ever getting leaked? Probably never. Christine Chubbuck. Our final piece of lost media comes from one of the most controversial ones ever. And that is the death of Christine Chubbuck. Christine Chubbuck took her life live on air after a long battle with depression. It's believed that a contributing factor to everything was the fact that Christine struggled heavily with maintaining any sort of intimate relationships with people. In school, she even jokingly formed a dateless wonder club for all of the women that had gotten rejected by boys in the school. She also utilized very heavy levels of self-deprecation, such as constantly beating herself up for not getting dates, not having any partners, her being a virgin at the age of 30 years old, and having only dated two men in her whole life. Additionally, she even tried to take her life by overdosing. It's clear that Christine was going through a lot. This, coupled with further demeaning language that she brought upon herself, just led to a nasty concoction of depression that she just couldn't shake. The warning signs for what she was about to do was there. She even joked around with some of her coworkers saying, hey, what if I blew myself away on air? Like, Christine, what? She's practically screaming to these people that she needs help, but 
I don't know, maybe she was just really good at hiding it. On July 15th of 1974, Chubbuck would take her life on air shortly after running through her usual stories about the area. Her final words were as follows. In keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first, in living color, an exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. Christine would then take her life on air with a revolver. Now, this segment of Lost Media is really sought after for obvious reasons. I mean, the first person to take their life on a live television broadcast is one hell of a reputation to have. The likelihood of this footage ever surfacing is pretty rare, but there have been splashes of information that have cropped up over the years on the internet. It's been speculated that someone could have recorded the broadcast at home, but this is highly unlikely due to VCRs with recording capabilities being rare at the time. There is a reported copy to exist that's in the hand of Molly Nelson, the widow of the former owner of the WXLT TV. In 2017, there was footage making the rounds on the internet that supposedly was real and it showed her doing it. But this was debunked as fake by a person that worked with Christine. The footage is on Internet Archive if you want to take a look yourself. And in all honesty, if you knew little to nothing about like the way the room was set up, why it's in black and white for some reason, even though she literally says on color television in her final words now. In early 2021, a YouTuber by the name of Atalist would upload what appears to be a genuine copy of the audio. There were two videos that were uploaded to this channel. One that was basically the audio leading up to the incident, but not of the incident itself. And then another video, which is the audio leading up to it. And as she goes through with it, no footage of it, but audio. The audio itself is actually still hosted on YouTube, so if that's something that you want to listen to, it's there. But in all honesty, I find it absolutely disturbing how calm and collected Christine was during it. It's really eerie, but it also puts you into the mindset of just where Christine was at that time. It's almost like she knew what she was going to do and she stuck with it. It's terrifying, it's tragic, and it's more than anything just sad. Lost media is a really fascinating phenomenon that has taken off in the last decade or so. With so many types of lost media out there, it's kind of hard to say that you don't have interest in it. Do you think there is an entry that should have made the list? Feel free to comment below, and if I ever make a future video, I might use one of your suggestions. And once again, I'd like to thank GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video links in the description. Before we hop in the end segment though, I would like to thank my Tormented Knights and my Knighted Patrons. For my Tormented Knights, we have Andrea, EB Agent J, James, Nee, Willow, Shyla, and for my Knighted Patrons, I have Cherisey, Emma, Jessica, Lucino, Lucas, Poet, Shizen, Teddy, Timo. Thank you guys so much for your really generous support. It honestly means so much to me. Thank you all so much. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed the video, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't, though, why not dislike and let me know what I can improve on for next time. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you all in the next one.